Aloha and welcome back. I'm Fate Panther, and this is Monster Keeper. Or, uh, Monster Sanctuary. Sorry. Um. The idea at current is I'm going to try a couple of rounds of the infinite, the infinity arena. But then I'm going to do the one thing that I probably should have done from the get-go. And that is to have, uh, to read off all the entries. Wait, they're level 45? That is technically impossible. Alright, fine. Thank <laughs> you. 
Oops, wrong character. That's fine. This works. All right, one more try. of this episode, I'm going to be reading through every one of the monster entries. <clears throat> In Tales of the Old World, the spectral wolf is described as the most cunning of the familiars, and he was said to be the guardian patron of the snowy mountains and the dark forests. As with all other spectral familiars, the wolf was revered and respected too. But his relation to the people of the old world seemed more complicated. The dark forests of the wolf were feared and avoided, but at the same time the shamans called on the power of the wolf to protect the newborns from warlocks and other dark influences. History. <clears throat> Since the creation of the monster sanctuary in 0 AC, the spectral wolf has been the spectral familiar of the Veli's bloodline. In modern sanctuary folklore, 
The spectral wolf is said to be a friend to strangers and those who prefer the company of beasts to the company of men. Who would rather stay in the wilds than the warm halls of the keeper's stronghold. The keeper, uh, keepers of the spectral wolf aren't seen as particularly warm people, but they are respected for their keen judgment, thanks to their perspective and logical nature. They are often called upon to decide matters of dispute among residents of this monster sanctuary. Spectral Toad, Entry 2 Bio In the old world, the spectral toad was regarded as the wisest and most generous of the familiars. He was revered in the lands near the mighty rivers and in the coastal areas. The debate whether the spectral toad is the same toad that had been worshipped by the practitioners of witchcraft since the beginning of time. There is some debate. Okay. Um, the warlock's toad, as it is sometimes called, is associated with the misty swamps and the mysterious forlorn places of the deepest reaches of the wilds, where human fear to tread. Finding the Warlock's Toad was said to be a perilous journey, but one, uh, one which might reward the aspiring wizard with an arcane secret. <clears throat> History Since 0 AC, the Spectral Toad has been the spectral familiar of the Herrick bloodline. The toad is said to offer ser uh, the toad has uh, the toad is see said to often serve as a teacher to young keepers, even outside their own bloodline. Keepers of the spectral toad are said to be the most knowledgeable in whatever field they study, occasionally exhibiting a remarkable powers of recollection. Some keepers of the toad have used their spectral uh, special knowledge to gain extensive resources and wealth. But it is written that they were always happy to share their riches with their family and friends. I have a funny feeling I picked the right spectral familiar for the way the story played out. We'll see with the spectral eagle and the spectral lion. Um, actually, I will be right back talking like this this early in the morning. It's starting to hurt my throat, so I'm going to get some tea. People of the Old World regarded the Spectral Eagle as the bravest of the Spectral Familiars. He was said to embody the, uh, be the embodiment of the sun, having control over the winds and the weather. Some particularly colorful stories said uh, also speak of hidden realms above the clouds that were ruled by the Spectral Eagle alone. Nonetheless, we had a great, uh, he had a great importance to sailors, traders of port cities, and the people of the great deserts. To this day, pirate captains keep birds of colorful splendor as their pets, as a way to honor the spectral eagle. Since 0 AC, the spectral e eagle has been the spectral familiar of the Ta- uh, Tayaze 
family. They are seafaring people by tradition, and they are in charge of all trade that is undertaken between the Monster Sanctuary and the Old World, which is only done by ship. It is written that the Eagle and the original keepers of the Eagle sacrificed themselves in war, in the war between the first Monster Keepers and the Kings of the Old World. The eagle rose again from his ashes after a few days, and he cried for his fallen keeper for uh, for an entire day. Ooh. <clears throat> spectral lion. Tales of the old world make the spectral lion out to be the noblest and most heroic familiar. Yeah, no, I, I picked the right one of the familiars, ruling over great prairies and tropical jungles. Some ancient texts of civilizations long forgotten have even attributed the creation of the deserts to him. There is a great many tales of him fighting against evil and hunting down demons, but the stories also often warn that you should never draw the lion's wrath upon yourself. The lion was believed to guard those who were devoted to him and those pure of heart. If you gained his trust, he would protect you and your family from all perils. History. Since 0 AC, the spectral lion had been the spectral bloodline of the Narasama bloodline. Keepers of the spectral lion almost always rise to the highest ranks of the order adding their ever-present, uh, ever-more prestige to the family name. Thus, it seems natural that the keepers of the Spectral Lion are seen as figures of great authority among their order, always taking part in discussions that occur that concern the sanctuary as a whole. They prevail... They... Fly... Belief... Oh, the prevalent belief among the keepers of the lion is that there must be some semi-balance of law to prevent evil from corrupting the sanctuary. Now your first non-spectral familiar monster. <clears throat> Gelatinous, amorphous, transparent, semi-solid, slimy, blobs. Many keepers don't think much of them, but it should be noted that they were several high rank. There are uh, there were several high ranking monster keepers in history who employed a blob in their t uh, team of monsters. Keeper uh, uh, keeper master Duncan even once called his blob the most trusty and steely companion, although it might have been in jest. It is tradition for monster keepers to, of the family to manage a farm of blobs just west of the keeper's stronghold. History. The blobs were dezenant, denizens, denizens of the monster sanctuary from the moment of its creation. Curiously, there were no known stories of the blob from the old world. Could it be that the mo uh, magic that was used to create the sanctuary somehow also brought blobs into the new world? Are they just a random byproduct of the sanctuary, or is their existence linked to the nature of the sanctuary? Nobody knows for sure, as the scribes from the that era didn't seem to assign blobs with much importance. They took blobs for granted, and perhaps it is best uh, for us to do the same. The notion of a hidden realm that is only inhabited by blobs is generally seen as ridiculous by most monster keepers. Except that's exactly what happens. Magma Pillar Bio. This gigantic caterpillar has evolved beyond predators of the animal kingdom, but even the most impressive of its abilities is to generate intense heat and even flame by way of metabolic heat. Unlike other insects, the uh, magma pillar doesn't have to bask in the sun to maintain its body temperature. Although magma pillars 
can often sometimes be seen laying in groups to increase their collective heat. Once a magma pillar reaches a certain age, it creates a cocoon of searing hot silk around itself. Any living thing that comes close to this cocoon gets burned to a crisp. History. It has been documented since the first days of the monster sanctuary how to quench the se uh, severe blazing heat of the magma pillar silk. Once the silk has been stripped away from its scorching heat, it can be woven into sturdy, long-lasting garments with magical properties. Most monster keepers' clothes are made in this way. The magma pillars belong to the original monster species that were endangered by the infamous Greed of the Kings, which was m monuments, a uh, moment, uh, uh, monuments, which the monuments along with the Keeper's Trail speak of. Oh, okay. The Magma Pillars and their adult forms were in instrumental in the war between the first Monster Keepers and the Kings of the Old World. And they have been the trusted companions of Keepers ever since. Rocky. Despite their name, there are mysteries surrounding their well-meaning uh, nature of spirit. Okay. Despite their name, there is mystery surrounding what these well-meaning nature spirits are made of. Their exterior is hard and unyielding like rock. And anyone who tries to lift a rocky will break their back trying to raise its extremely heavy body. But then how would it be possible for plants and flowers to sprout from their bodies? Out of their body. The only explanation is that Rockies are capable of controlling nature to a degree that is unequaled by any other monster. Their very existence combines the quality of rock, earth, and plant life. History. The stories of Rockies have been shared among uh, across many century or er, countries of the world since the dawn of mankind. As long as anyone can remember, the Rockies have been shy desonants of dense forests, bright coves, craggy mountains alike, and craggy mountains alike. Still, Rockies are very uh, are rarely shown themselves to anyone. Even a wanderer or woodsman might never encounter a single one in their life. Instead, it would uh, usually be the young or the naive that spot a rocky. One popular story even tells of a young boy who had lost his way in the forest and happened upon a group of rockies that played with him and guided him back to his homestead. Oh, that's neat. Burial. Their appearance vaguely resembles a blue jay, although they are much larger and heavier. A vario is Prime's rival of any bird of prey its size. Okay, let's try that again. A vario in its prime rivals any bird of prey's size, and they are constantly and they can constantly beat their wings for several days without getting tired. However, their, its immense strength, it is their immense strength and aptitude for magic that classifies them as monsters. Something that regular hunters or animal wranglers is unequipped to handle. Despite Verio's considerable size, the people of the old world often mistook it for a regular bird, trying to hunt it down. <laughs> Those hunters were swiftly met with strong blows and deadly feather storms. Everyone in their village would thereafter know the difference between a bird and a verio. There was only a single falconer in history who was known to tame and train a verio to follow his commands, without the use of magic. 
the name of this falcon heir is Falco. And he used his companion to hunt down various criminals and fight justice. His trusted Iberio stayed by his side until he died of old age, many years before the sanctuary was formed. The Vario flew back to the wilds where it lived for another century or so. Cat Zerker! Oh, there's more history on this than a bio. Weird. Okay. These courageous feline creatures roamed the mountains of the wild uh, for wild beasts to slay. They were originated from an original kitten that set out to find its lost master. Oh, it's a Puss in Boots reference. I sh should have known with the boots and everything. They say that there was once there once was a legendary knight named by the name of Siegfried. He put down his blade on a field of grass. When an ordinary kitten with gray fur came and sat upon the blade, Siegfried took the kitten as his pet and brought it to his keep, where the cat lounged many evenings before the heath, uh, hearth. Eventually, Siegfried rode out on an adventure of which he never returned. The cat missed its master and went to look for him. Eventually, it found Siegfried's blade, but there was no trace of the cat's va uh, valiant master. The cat sat upon the blade just as it had once done so many years ago, and waited eagerly for its master's return. After many days and nights, had passed, the blade. Uh, the cat decided that it would bring the blade to its master. Cats are stubborn creatures, so the cat learned to carry the blade with its paws. As it dragged the drug the sword through the countryside, the cat's physique changed gradually until it became the first cat zerker. However, it was never found. It never found its master in all of its nine lives. God, some of these are really sad. Mm -hmm. Doesn't help that my nose this it's oh now now we're gonna fucking clog up. There's still stuff I haven't unlocked with the these guys. I don't think I'll go back and deal with it. As much as I love playing this game, I've no more levels to gain. <coughs> Bio. The Yahweh's used to avoid humans at all costs, going to great lengths not to show themselves. However, ever since they were brought to the sanctuary, they come become more jovial as well as battlesome. Happily taking challengers uh, challenges from starting monster keepers. The Yaoi is, uh, is speculated to be a distant relative of humans. History. Yaoi was once uh, was long thought to be just a myth. Many people collected footprints of this invasive beast, but often um, varied in size and number of toes. But they, uh, even the early monster keepers weren't sure of their existence. And it was by complete happenstance that a monster keeper came upon a Yaoi in 97 AC while traversing a desolate icy mountainside in the search of a village of Mogwais. Keeper Ranger Ranya was surprised by a relentless snowstorm. She found shelter in a nearby cave, where she met a Yaoi mother and her infants. The ranger keeper showed the Yaois that she didn't mean them harm, and in turn was taught the ways of the Yaoi. She convinced the Yaoi mother to come to the sanctuary, and thereafter managed to find a great number of Yaois that lived in the mountains and forests of the land. Uh, steam gold. These mechanical workers were engineered by m m uh, mechanics 
who dabbled in the alchemy. In alchemy. The steam golems eventually rebelled against their masters and destroyed the factories they were placed in. Although they cannot speak, it seems that they are capable, uh, able to communicate with each other, even across vast distances. The steam golems were brought to the sanctuary in 20, uh, 270 AC. Promptly, the construction began of a workshop with magical tools made to maintain and repair the golems. Soon after the workshop was constructed, the golems surprised the keepers and showed their capacity for automaton, uh, autonomous learning when they began to use tools on themselves. However, the surprise turned to shock when the golems used the tools to replicate themselves even to construct new mechanical beings. The keepers lost control of the workshop, and the effort had been made ever since to prevent the workshop's golem from gaining the resources required to replicate themselves indefinitely. <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ knows. Like, right now, of all times, I really don't need you to fuck up, and you're making it difficult for me. But okay, so this explains the workshop. Monk. These mysterious humanoids never speak and live in solitude, even though I fought a pack of three of them. It is said that they dwell in secret places, caves hidden beneath the waterfalls, uh, in caves hidden beneath the waterfall where they might even establish themselves makeshift monasteries. However, there are many stories of the monks coming to aid of injured mountain climbers, nourishing them back to health, and guiding them to treacherous mountain paths. Monks are one of the few monster species that immigrated willingly to the monster sanctuary. In 3 AC, it is assumed that all of the monks who lived in the mountain lands of the Old World left their hidden domiciles and ventured to the monster sanctuary. Perhaps they saw that it was inevitable for the humans of the Old World to encroach upon their sacred monasteries and tribes. Indeed, many of the abandoned monasteries left behind in the Old World had since been pillaged and destroyed. Okay, Grummery. Grummery. These creatures of the dark corners of the ocean are known for their various supernatural qualities. They outlive humans by far. Although their, the scholars seem to agree upon how long a... Can't agree upon how long they live exactly. Old tales of the coastal areas say a Grummery ne never forgets and never forgives. Even as centuries pass and empires rise and fall, the skin of a grammar is thick, spongy, and toxic to a deadly degree. No matter how it is cooked or prepared, the insides of grammar are more pulpous than fishes or mouths. So you're saying it's a giant fungus? Oh, okay. We're going that route. Their body indicates another worldly origin, which coincides with the cryptic passages from Idol of Whatever, written by the blind star seer. This ancient book of demons was written in times where, when man was sparsest, uh, sparsely able to to glimpse the terrors that lurked within our planet or beyond. It holds knowledge that is still considered dangerous and abhorrent. According to these sculpture, uh, scriptures, Grimmeries entered our plane as an unworldly incursion of the, uh, of the great Garamu a deathless dreamer 
who holds the key of ancient fallen realms of Shagoth and Nerkulth. The great Garamu is said to reside in unseen realms underneath the sea. He is biding, biding his time until he can change, uh, take charge of this plane. Wow! So, yeah, straight up Cthulhu. Mm -hmm. Fucking nose. Seriously, stop it. Tengu! Mysterious creatures that seem only to have a single redeeming quality. Their love for song and dance. However, they only approach a human when they wish to play a childish prank on them or impress them with their magical power, magical powers. It is known that you should always entertain a Tengu's jipes and never do anything to infuriate them. Unless you want to test a Tengu's mastery of fire and poison. For many years, monster keepers tried to reason with Tengu's and motivate them to come to the sanctuary. Significant advances had been made in science and technology, and humans no longer feared uh, mischievous spirits of the mountains and woods. It was inevitable that the Tengu's pranks would just uh, soon cause humans to retaliate in force. However, Tengu's proved arrogant and would become violent when keepers pursued them on the sub uh, <laughs> pushed them on the subject. It only changed when the young keeper, but uh, young but wise keeper ranger Gatico was put to the task in 17 AC. He devised, uh, deceived the Tengu, playing tricks on them, and even hired actors for his schemes. Within a year, he managed to bring all the Tengus of the wild to the sanctuary without conflict. We're only on 15? Oh my god, this has got to be a... Uh, I... Oh man. This portion of the thing... Um, I think I'll get through this page in the next episode do more. And hopefully at that time, my nose won't fucking run. Yeah. <laughs> A biological miracle in the form of a sentient fungus that grew arms, muscles, and the ca uh, capability of violent uh, poison attacks. This allows the fungus to protect itself against those who take mushrooms for easy pickings. Additionally, funga uh, funguses, well, because they're called fungi, you can't call fungi fungi because... Uh, are able to generate a multitude of spores that spawn a variety of long, uh, large edible mushrooms. These oversized mushrooms can be harvested without danger and provide plenty of nutritious nourishment. Many dishes that use these mushrooms are called fungi in their... God, just stop with that. It seems that there is a little... It, Seems there is little reason to hunt the fungus. Especially since they provide their own environment with food that doesn't need to be hunted. However, nobles of the old world and those who thought themselves noble had long developed a taste for the, the fungi itself. Still, the fungi were never in danger of dying out thanks to their tenacity and longevity. Despite this fact, the first monster keepers deemed it... Uh, Dis despicable to go after funguses with only one, uh, which only wanted to be left alone. By 2 AC, all of the funguses in the forests and caverns of the old world were gathered by keepers and taken to the sanctuary. 
Frosties burn with a freezing cold, extinguishing all heat around them. A supernatural phenomenon without a doubt. Neither wizards nor alchemists have ever managed to produce a flame that freezes the air around it. But they have tried. According to popular folklore of Nordic countries, Frosties are grandchildren of the myst mystical figure known as the god <laughs> Grandfather Frost. They reside in the uncharted forests of the Ever Snow, where the god uh, Grandfather Frost also uh, is also said to live. Though no trace of him has ever been found, these forests are among the few places of the old world that are deemed safe for monsters. Humans avoid these woods entirely as it is nearly impossible to breach the sheer cold of the veil that surrounds the areas. Unfortunately, most of the monsters would not survive living in the forest of Eversnow, even at either due to the aforementioned deadly chill or and the lack of food sources. Still, for safety's sake, several Frosties were brought to the sanctuary in 177 AD. They seem to prefer staying close to the ponds and cool lakes of the Blue Caves. Many Keeper poets have since remarked on their beautiful twist, uh, twirling frosty shine to reflect upon the cave's waters. Okay. Minitar! Uh, mini These five feet tall bullvine warriors exemplarily wield their oversized war axes like no human could. Beyond their uh, martial prowess, they also wield spells of different kinds to enhance their destructive potential and protect their kin. An enraged Minitar at full potential might summon a stone rain as a destructive impact of a meteor. The story of the Minitar is deeply embedded in the ancient mythology. The story of the Minitar on the Okay. The story of the oh, the story of the Mi uh, Minotaur. Okay. But the story of the Minotaur, on the other hand, is a lesser known one. Ah. Uh, it begins with a band of clever adventurers who sought to get the treasure hidden within the Minotaur's labyrinth. Those five adventurers went to the labyrinth together, but each of them took a different path. The Minotaur could not be placed all, all at once, so he split himself into five, creating the first Minitars and fending off the intruders. Weird. <coughs> a blazing phantom that bears the bears the shape of a human skeleton. It's believed that its flames are capable of burning away both flesh and spirit. That is, if you get too close to a hostile specter's fire, you might lose a part of your soul. According According to the recounts, uh, accounts of unfortunate Keeper Rangers, it would burn away into a puff of smoke that smells like brimstone. Furthermore, these uh, these unfortunate keepers experience a natural chill in their bones, which only dissipate after a few days. History. The first specter appeared in the monks' sanctuary at 13 AD. It seemed to be peaceable and sticking to its territory. However, stories of the keepers who approached it and experienced strange sensations quickly spread throughout the sanctuary 
and spurred superstition. Some monster keepers argued that the specter is an incarnation of evil and had to be vanquished. However, spectral, uh, spectral keepers decided that all monsters deserve the sanctuary. Crackle Knight. A living set of armor with the power of lightning, which is often found brooding in the abandoned castle ruins. However, the Crackle Knight has no lack of personality. And there are many stories of Crackle Knight's sense of honor and their noble nature. Once a monster keeper has earned the respect of a Crackle Knight, it is not uncommon for the Crackle Knight to make its life goal protecting the master from all perils. It is unknown how the Crackle Knight came to exist uh, into existence, although many stories and ballad, uh, ballads from medieval times that feature them in prominent roles. In one of these stories, a group of bandits and re uh, renegade knights fled into a story a uh, forest glade after ransacking a nearby village. Of course, they did not know the legendary knight Gwendolyn who wielded the Sword of Lightning and who had made solemn vow a century ago that these lands would forever be under his protection. As nightfall, uh, nightfall came, a rainstorm fell upon the bandits. Lightning struck the earth. The crackled night emerged from it. He challenged the bandits, and one by one, he exe uh, executed, uh, exacted his revenge and felled them all. Galru, the dungeon stalking Galru, represents a altered form of the deep sea grummery. After its transformation, the Growl Rule retains its mastery over the tides, but it prefers to inhabit dry places, with a preference towards man-made lairs. The old stories of the Growl Rule's creation, which lair, uh, creating such lairs within underwater caves of the old world. According to the ancient demon tome, uh, the Growl's are said to perform dark rituals in these lairs as an attempt to awaken their immortal master, the great Garamau. There are records of two groups of monster keepers that have embarked on expedition to uncover the hidden lairs in 113 AC and 136 AC. The first expedition, nobody returned. The second expedition was led by uh, monster, uh, Keeper Ranger Holly Payton. <coughs> the daughter of the first expeditioner's leader. She was determined to discover what tragedy had befallen her father and his daring expedition party. After the desperate uh, departure from their sanctuary, none of them were seen again in years. It took five years for a single keeper novice from that doomed second expedition to return to the sanctuary. The boy returned as a mute and never spoke another word until the day of his death, until he died of natural causes. Book. Okay, well, that's page one. We have one, two, three, four, five pages to go. Uh, so I'll catch you all in the next episode where we read another page, I guess, because it takes me like 30 minutes to read through all that stuff. Probably less if my nose wouldn't fucking run. Uh, I will catch you all then. Until then, have fun, be safe, and aloha.